A reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. In a vision, I, Daniel, saw during the night the four winds of heaven stirred up the great sea, from which emerged four immense beasts, each different from the others. The first was like a lion, but with eagle's wings. While I watched, the wings were plucked. It was raised from the ground to stand on two feet like a man and given a human mind. The second was like a bear. It was raised up on one side, and among the teeth in its mouth were three tusks. It was given the order, up, devour much flesh. After this, I looked and saw another beast, like a leopard. On its back were four wings, like those of a bird, and it had four heads. To this beast, dominion was given. After this, in the visions of the night, I saw the fourth beast, different from all the others, terrifying, horrible, and of extraordinary strength. It had great iron teeth with which it devoured and crushed, and what was left it trampled with its feet. I was considering the ten horns it had, when suddenly another, a little horn, sprang out from their midst. And three of the previous horns were torn away to make room for it. This horn had eyes like a man, and a mouth that spoke arrogantly. As I watched, thrones were set up, and the Ancient One took his throne. His clothing was snow bright, and the hair on his head as white as wool. His throne had flames of fire. With wheels of burning fire, a surging stream of fire flowed out from where he sat. Thousands upon thousands were ministering to him, and myriads upon myriads attended him. The court was convened, and the books were opened. I watched, then, from the first of the arrogant words which the horn spoke until the beast was slain, and its body thrown into the fire to be burnt up. The other beasts, which also lost their dominion, were granted a prolongation of life for a time and a season. As the visions during the night continued, I saw one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. When he reached the Ancient One and was presented before him, he received dominion, glory, and kingship. Nations and peoples of every language serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not be taken away. His kingship shall not be destroyed. The word of the Lord. Give glory and eternal praise to him. Mountains and hills bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. Everything growing from the earth bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. You springs bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. Seas and rivers bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. You dolphins and all water creatures bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. All you birds of the air bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. All you beasts, wild and tame, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever.
Dominus Fobiscum. Lexio Sati Evangelii Secundum Lucam. Jesus told his disciples a parable. Consider the fig tree and all the other trees. When their buds burst open, you see for yourselves and know that summer is now near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Amen, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Verbum Domini. Welcome to a very large group from up north, I believe from New Jersey and New, New York. Welcome to EWTN. I think it's the largest crowd that has ever come in here with such uh, peace and not chaos. So congratulations on that this morning, coming in here in less than two minutes before Mass. It's good to be back home in Alabama after a month in Rome and visiting our EWTN uh, Vatican Bureau and then a longer visit with my family in Pennsylvania and uh, Maryland and Colorado. And I had the privilege of attending the EWTN affiliate meeting in Zakopane, Poland, where EWTN partners from Poland, Ireland, Germany, Romania, Ukraine, Croatia, Nordic countries, Norway and Sweden, all came together to for their annual meeting to talk about the growth of EWTN. We often speak about the growth of EWTN on our programming, and I'm sure our viewers and listeners hear about us talking about this particular growth in countries around the world. But I must admit that it's an entirely different phenomena when you meet the people behind the growth and not just hearing about the growth in general, but hearing and listening to the stories of the people behind the growth that have put their lives on the line for this mission that they feel that the Lord is calling them to. From EWTN Germany, we have here today a few from our Germany office in Poland, and again, northern Scandinavian countries in Norway and Sweden, et cetera, et cetera. Again, these folks have put their lives and sacrificed so much of their lives to make the content that EWTN produces available in their countries and in their own language. And I even met the priest, Father Alexander, who almost single-handedly kept EWTN Ukraine on the air in the capital of Kiev in Ukraine during these last almost two years of war. And again, you can hear about it from a distance, but actually meeting these people who feel called and put their lives literally on the line to risk the eternal word reaching these places and giving hope to people. I think it gives new definition to what Mother Angelica used to say, guts. Mother Angelica used to say that guts, boldness, is the eighth gift of the Holy Spirit, quote unquote. She never created new doctrine, <laughs> but she used to say that guts, we need guts. We need a holy boldness in our faith. And again, meeting these people in person gave me a greater perspective of how the work and mission of EWTN 
to proclaim to the church and advance the teachings of the church is more important than ever. So thank you to our viewers again that make this possible. The month of December is dedicated to Our Lady and more specifically to her title of the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception teaches, the church teaches, is that the most blessed Virgin Mary was from the first moment of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God and by the virtue of merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. In these last days of ordinary time, after Christ the King Sunday, the church begins to prepare for a new liturgical season and to prepare for the shorter penitential season of Advent. The emphasis on prayer and penance during Advent is a lot shorter than Lent. Lent is a lot longer. And especially this year, Advent is a lot shorter. So we have a lot shorter of time to really focus on the season of Advent, the meaning of the season, three weeks and one day to be precise, Advent is. It's one of the shortest Advents in the last seven, eight years. Sometimes we have a full four weeks of Advent, but because of the calendar, it's three weeks and one day, so prepare. This is your little warning, <laughs> prepare. Prepare well. Preparing with Our Lady can and should always be part of the celebration of Advent. There is no one that understood more and better the events and circumstances of Advent, the coming of the birth of the Messiah, than the one who gave birth to the Messiah. That's why we draw close to her always drawing close to Our Lady. Jesus is the fruit of her womb. We talk about fruit today in the gospel, the fig. Jesus is the fruit, the fruit of Mary's womb, the fruit of her faith. In order to understand the story and the plot, it's important to draw close to those essential characters in the narrative. The story of salvation is the greatest story ever told. I don't know about you, but I always love to, to be read to. Children, I think specifically, like to be read to, to receive a good story. And even to be told that story over and over and over again. I would bring the same books to my mom. Read this again, read it again. I don't care how many times. And you know what? She still has those books. Over again, the story of salvation is the greatest story. Because it's the story of rescue. It's the story of salvation. It's the story that applies to every human heart and every human soul. God raising up a fallen world. Advent is the holy season of waiting and expectation. The church enters into that holy longing that the chosen people of Israel had and even still possess, the waiting of the promised Messiah. We enter into that time of the kingdom. The kingdom has come. The church teaches that the kingdom of God has come on earth, Jesus, Jesus is the kingdom. He has come, but not yet fully. Does that make sense? He has come in grace, and he still continues to come, but we still await his final coming. And that's what Advent is about also as well, is about waiting for the second coming of our Lord when he will come in glory with all of his angels.
Although the Messiah and Lord has come, the Word made flesh and has dwelt among us, the incarnation of the Son of God. He was crucified, died, and was buried and rose from the dead on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. We still have that longing. Again, he has come, but not yet. That longing that we should have for the Messiah. Marantha, these are the last words of some of the last words of sacred scripture in the book of Revelation. Come, Lord Jesus. And this can pray, be a prayer that we pray all throughout Advent. And you can teach your children to say this. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus. The parable of the fig tree is meant to teach us about the signs of the times. The fig tree was a common staple food in Jewish society. Twice a year it bore fruit. The ancient commentaries of the Jewish scriptures said that the first fruit of the year would come the day after Passover. For Jews, the Messiah would come during Passover time to bring in the kingdom of God. Remember that Passover is the celebration of God's rescue. The rescue of the people of God from Egypt, from slavery. The Passover itself foreshadowed the Passover, the rescue of Jesus Christ, bringing in the redemption and deliverance who those, of those who believe in him and in his name. And within this story, within this narrative of rescue and deliverance, we are all called to be rescued. Do you think that you are beyond rescue? Do you believe that you need to be rescued? That's something I would like to leave you with. And rescued from what? You can answer that question. I won't answer it. Do you think that you need to be rescued? This is part of the story of salvation. Hint, we all need to be rescued. This is essential part of the story of salvation. The Gospel of St. Luke says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The words of the Lord Jesus are eternal life, and we can stake our life on those words and root our lives in those words. The promises that the Lord Jesus speak pass from this life to the next life. The words of the Lord Jesus do not have an expiration date. Thanks be to God. They go, they go on from age to age, from generation to generation, and they are ever new. They never go stale. But they are the words of everlasting life. The word of the Lord is ever ancient, ever new. And his words are like salt that can season and preserve our lives. The more we allow the word of the Lord to penetrate the soul of our lives and even the soil of our lives, we begin to resemble the one who we read and communicate and to contemplate with. The more we allow the word of the Lord, in other words, to land on pure soil, that word will change us. We begin to act more like Christ. This is what we see in the lives of the saints especially. That word of the Lord so much penetrated their souls and their life that they became like mirrors of God. God and his life living in the world. That's what it means to be a Christian. 
is to be alter Christus, other Christs in the world. Transform, the world transformed, the world renewed. His words are unlike any other words issued from the mouth. His words are truly meant to govern us and to bring order out of chaos. Again, rescue, this theme of rescue. We need to be rescued. When his words are spoken into our lives, they find a ready home, a home that is prepared to receive the life-giving word of the Lord. Again, his words are ever ancient, ever new. Speaking his words of salvation, reading his words and letting them find a home in our own soil.